All right, you guys, so I'm back as Chief. I hope everybody's doing well out there. <clears throat> so I'm gonna get right into it. I don't like the whole intro thing, so I'd like to just jump right on in. I don't like to waste any time. But we're talking about the story of De Madame Delphine Lalaurie from New Orleans, Louisiana. And I stumbled across this story because I was actually looking up, you know, the most haunted houses in uh, Louisiana. And I came across this one, which was the Lalaurie Mansion, okay? And it's said to be one of the most, if not the most haunted mansion in New Orleans. And what I'm about to tell you will explain to you exactly why. So, Madame Delphine Lalaurie was actually born Marie Delphine McCarty in New Orleans, Spanish Louisiana on March 19, 1787, and she was one of five children. She was born in, priv in privilege, um, so basically she was a wealthy white woman in the 1700s, 17 and 1800s in New Orleans. So, you know, there's, that's already very loaded. Um, there's a lot of slavery, a lot of things that was going on in that time, during that time. And she was a woman of privilege. Both of her parents were part of New Orleans European Creole culture, like the prominent side of that culture. And she also had an uncle who was um, married into the family. And he was actually the governor of the Spanish American provinces of Louisiana and then she had a cousin who was the mayor of New Orleans between between the years of 1850 to 1820 so she was well known and people actually said that she was a pleasant person like growing up and people liked her she was always pleasant when she went out when she had her slaves she was always pleasant to um, to people of color what when she went out so no one really suspected what was going on behind closed doors. So by all appearances, you know, she was on the up and up. Everyone liked her. She was nice to everyone, including her slaves. So it seemed she was nice to people of color out in public, but there was something about her that made people kind of question and, um, and and stand back just a little bit because it seemed like she was always like had, had high spirits. She always looked nice. She was always decked out. She smelled nice. You know, she had that going on. But her slaves always seemed to be like on their last leg, on the last breath. And people just said that, that that it just made people feel like something was not quite adding up with how well it seemed that she was doing and how poorly it seemed like her slaves were doing that were that lived with her. And also during this time, it became illegal to mistreat your slaves. So you couldn't just do whatever you wanted to to them. And they would actually have people to come out and check on the slaves to make sure that they were well kept, you know, like property, like animals. They would make sure that they were well taken care of, they were well fed, and everything was okay. But for some reason, somehow, no one, when, when people would go to um, to check on the slaves at Delphine's house, at Madame Delphine Lalaurie's house or home, they would just come away with it or come away from there without reporting anything suspicious. All the while, she was killing people, torturing people, um, starving them. She was a collector of torture devices and like just the whole nine. But we're gonna get into that a little bit later, all right? I'm just gonna give you a little bit more history behind her and how she actually got the last name. So Delphine was married actually three times. She had her very first marriage at a super early age, the ripe age of 13. You know, they did things a lot differently back then. They got married very soon or very early and had a bunch of kids. You were considered pretty much like dead and decrepit at 35, 38 back then, all right? So she was married for her very, the very first time at 13 years old to a high-ranking Spanish officer. He, while she was pregnant with their first child, they, he was summoned to go to the high court of Madrid, but he died en route while she was pregnant. So she came back to New Orleans then and had their child together, which happened to be a little girl. It was her first child, and she came back to New Orleans and kind of settled in there. Her second marriage was with a prominent banker in New Orleans, and um, they had four children together. So now she has five children, but he also died of mysterious causes, and they don't know what happened to him. But even though two of her, uh, two of her first husbands died, 
no one really questioned it because again, everyone loved her. So no one really expected any um, foul activity or suspicious activity. And they just kind of went along with it. So now she has her five kids. Her second husband has died. And now she, she still um, hasn't met the third husband, which is a younger guy. I believe he was in his 20s as well. And he was a prominent doctor, physician, who his mission was to cure humpbacks. Um, so that was his thing. While she was married to Dr. Lalari, um, which is where she got that last name from, finally, she um, they, they bickered and fought a lot. So there was strain on the marriage at a very early age in their marriage. And like I said before, he was younger. He was about 15 years her junior. So he was a younger man. And they say that he kind of helped drive her crazy. And I know how that can be. And a lot of people could probably relate to that. But even though they had a lot of issues in their relationship, they were broken up several times and they actually got a divorce. But their kids even reported that even though they were separated, they were still kind of living together and they were still, you know, doing the do and all of that good stuff, even though they were broken up, broken up. And that brings me to the next thing, which is where the shit really hits the fan with the, the whole Delphine Lalari saga is on April the 10th there was a fire that spread through the house and just kind of had some shit uncovered that no one even suspected and it's gonna blow your mind. <sighs> so on April the 10th, 1834, there was a mysterious fire that swept through the house that started, that it is believed that started in the kitchen. She had one of her slaves chained up in the kitchen an elderly woman that was starved and this woman set the kitchen on fire because she couldn't find any other way to, to escape the pain and the torture that she was in. She couldn't jump from a window, you know, she couldn't take her own life, like, you know, by cutting her wrist or anything like that. So she decided to, to set the kitchen on fire and she would rather burn alive than to have one more day dealing with Delphine Lallery and the torture that she was putting her through. So when the fire happened, someone ran into the house to, to help her, but noticed that Delphine wasn't, she, she was only really worried about or concerned about saving her, her jewels, her furs and, and things like that, the material things. And when, when it was asked like, where's your help to help you? She, she told that person that man it's none of your business. And so this raised, you know, red flags for that man. More locals started to come in and try to help extinguish the fire. And when they did this, they started to find torture devices all throughout the house. The types of torture devices, devices that they were first finding were things like um, the chains and collars around the, um, the slaves' necks that were so tight they couldn't move their head. They, she would have like a whole um, face thing covered so they couldn't eat or drink. They would find things like this around the house. And mind you, again, at this point in time, it's illegal to mistreat. It's, you can still have slaves, but it's illegal to mistreat them. So people started to look for the slaves because the slaves weren't anywhere to be found until they got into the attic. I also want to point out that Everyone knows that the relationship between her and her husband, that the third husband wasn't completely over because when they got to the house, he was already there. And he was actually also telling the people to mind their own business. So it's said that it's believed that he actually like encouraged her and showed her different ways of torturing people because he had the physician degree and he knew how to, to, to torture people to the brink of death and to kind of leave them and let them die. And that's exactly what she did. So she was telling she was telling people to mind their own business about where her slaves were. He was telling people to mind their own business where their slaves were. All the while, these people are looking for the slaves and trying to figure out where the fuck they at because they should be right here helping you and we're trying to get them out as well. So the people made it up into the attic and they saw basically a room full of horror. They found types of collars that had razors inside the collar so whenever the slave would breathe 
whenever they would take a breath, it, the razors would cut into their necks. And you know, the only way to stop that would be to stop breathing, but you can only do that for so long. So basically they killed themselves with the, the collar on. She would break some of the slaves' bones, especially the women. She had a, she had a hatred for slaves in general, but she particularly tortured the women a little bit more than the men. She would um, shove animal feces into their mouths and sew it shut. She would break their bones and make them look like creatures, uh, like spiders, uh, lobsters, and things like that. She would break their bones after the bones would heal and, um, and just torture these people. She would keep them in very tight, confined spaces while their bones were breaking. She would take hand tools and drill holes inside of the slave's head and wide enough to where she can fit a wooden spoon into she would either stir their brains with that wooden spoon or she would just take it out and throw it into the fire while they were still alive there's a report of finding a male slave that had um, a male victim that had a hole in his head that was full of maggots he was still alive there are reports of her putting the male slaves in torture device and female slaves in the torture devices that would pull them apart and when they were released their bodies were their bodies and muscles and tendons and bones were so pulled apart and so stretched out they could no longer stand they had to drag several of the victims out of the house during the fire also when she would drill the holes using a hand tool inside of their, their skulls. She would also sometimes take a hot coal and put it into that hole. She would hang her male victims on the wall inside of the attic and um, she would slice off their genitals little by little and just allow them to die on the wall while being hung up. <laughs> um, Yeah, there's an instance where she had a female slave, or I'm, so, I'm sure several female slaves hanging, and she would slice open their, their torso and pull out their intestines and wrap the intestines around the slave and, and kept them there until they died. The slaves knew that you never wanted to go into the attic because you wouldn't be seen. There's also a story about a little girl. She was combing Madam's hair and she came across a knot and she tried to, to comb it out. Madam Lalaurie became so upset about that that she whipped the, the little girl who was about 12 years old. She whipped her and the little girl just ran away. And it was so bad that the little girl just jumped off of the building, off of the house and ended her own life. And she was actually buried in a well. It is heartbreaking. It is heartbreaking to think about that. She would completely rearrange people's bodies, like from breaking their bones and resetting them in just awkward places. Again, like I mentioned before, she made one woman look like a human crab by the time she was rescued. So after all of this was, was, was found out, her, the local the local residents and everything became angry. So there was an angry mob trying to get at her and she and her family were trying to, to flee the scene. They were trying to run away like the fucking cowards they are. So after the, the mob, the violent mob tried to, to get to them and they were trying to flee the scene, which they actually managed to do somehow, they, they ran away to Paris. And that's where she, she later died. They, in, in Paris at the age of 62. And they're saying that when she was in Paris, her and that last husband, they finally got a divorce because he got tired of her complaining and 
wanting to go back to New Orleans, even though her children were telling her this was this is not a good idea. <laughs> You know, and the husband at the time was also telling her that, but it said that she started to suffer from dementia at a later age. So she didn't remember all of the shit that she had done back in New Orleans and she really wanted to go back. But again, she died in Paris at the age of 62. So, and that brings me back to why I was, why I even stumbled across this story because they're saying that that mansion that still stands today is one of the most haunted places in New Orleans. After the fire and everything happened, they actually converted that mansion into a, an apartment complex. While it was a, an apartment complex, one of the tenants died under very suspicious and very mysterious circumstances. And it was so bizarre that they're saying that it was because of paranormal activity, like, you know, slaves or something coming back for a little bit of vengeance. After that, they shut it down and they tried to turn it into an all black girls school. But these little girls were talking about being physically touched and seeing things and smelling things while they were there all the time. There were always reports about this. And then they had to shut it down again. So now it's just completely vacant and they're just using it as it's basically a tourist attraction. It's used for stops on ghost tours in New Orleans, which I definitely plan on, on going and checking that out and giving you guys more of a firsthand experience of what it's like to actually be there. If any of you out there have been there already, please let me know what you, um, what you, what you felt, what you saw, if you felt anything or the vibes you got, I would love to hear that. But that is the story behind the La La Rie Mansion and why I found it and it just intrigued me. But I'm definitely gonna be bringing you more of these stories. I hope that you guys enjoyed this or liked this. And um, stay tuned because I'm going to be bringing a lot more out of New Orleans and again from around the world because stories like this are just extremely intriguing to me and very interesting. I love all of the supernatural, um, the things and the ghosts and the true crimes and all of that. So I'm going to be bringing you a lot more of that. So stay tuned and I will see you guys in the very next video. All right.